backwards. Okay, let's pull out those uh, critique or the yeah self critique. So I, I want everybody to kind of do this, um, not kind of do it, let's just do it. Uh, and maybe at the end of the day, you can look and say, the areas that I really need help in, I got some help. Um, so if you've been in the course four or five times, there's something in here that you don't do as well as you would like to. Um, so. Um, We'll try to boost everybody. We'll raise the level. So item one, my level of understanding of exchanging and taxation. That's just knowing what this room is about. If this is your first time, that might be fairly low on well, exchanging. I've heard about 1031. That's not really what we're talking about. We will talk about that some, but that's not the most of the story. Um, taxation, I'm amazed at how little all of us know about taxation, or most of us know about taxation. My level of understanding of creative formulas. If you haven't had a creative formulas course, if you haven't gone through a um, uh, recession or two, there's some seats right over there. Oh, Ramon, are you saving a seat with your backpack? Somebody coming later? Um, creative formulas is not what we're going to be teaching in this course. We'll hit a couple as we're just talking about transactions. Uh, but there's courses for creative formulas. Creative formulas help when there's not enough money in the marketplace to do what you want to do whether you're buying, selling, financing, leasing. If you can do it with all money, that's fine. You maybe don't need a creative formula. Have you ever had a contract not come together with an offer because there wasn't enough money? There wasn't enough asking price or too much asking price and not enough offering price? So the formulas, that's important, but we're not going to get much of that today. Uh, my level of understanding of client counseling. Let's see, do we have a... So all of these have to do with client counseling. That's what we're doing today. So how are you with your questioning skills and your listening skills? We're going to talk a lot about both of those, particularly listening. Tools for gathering and remembering information. The ability to list quality properties and clients. Continue to market after the listing. So in these first four or five, does anybody care to share with us that you need some work in that area? If you're not a five or better, you need some work in those areas. Now this is where we start getting interactive. Because when I ask for input and you don't give any, I don't go any further. And we just, we just kind of pause. So, Lucas? Yeah, it can, be, it can be tough to engage your listening skills all the time when, especially back when the people doing residential where to us it's a day in the office, but to them it's one of maybe four scary transactions in their lives. <laughs> you know, been, Somebody buying or selling their house. They do four of those, and, and it's, it. yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's uh, uh, a lot of uh, emotion all the time. So listening for them and you can be hard. Yeah, because for us, we've heard the same, same series of questions and answers yeah. a thousand times. Um, so uh, dealing with clients' needs versus wants. I wonder what benefit marketing means. We'll find out. The actual session where you're meeting with your client one-on-one, uh, -on -one, um, is that a comfortable place to be? Understanding why the client is wanting to get out of title, client's motivation. Focus on being a taker. What's a taker mean? 
What's a taker mean? Someone who wants your property regardless of whether you want theirs. Which is different than a buyer. So we're always looking for takers, not just cash buyers. Somebody out there is going, I don't know what they're talking about. That's a perfect place to be. Multi-leg transaction, we're not going to spend much time on that. Most of us aren't very good at that. There might be two or three in here that are. That's a tough one. Uh, Follow-up. Networking with other exchange brokers, weekly, monthly, nationally. Um, so, uh, Cleve, could you tell us about the local exchange marketing group of which you're the president? Or the chair. I'm not sure what chair. my title is these days, but it's a mile high exchangers. We've been around since the 70s. I've been a member of the organization and chair few times along the way. I joined, I think, in like 1981, and I've probably closed at least $150 million out of this group over the years, and that's why I keep coming back. Uh, repeat and referral business. If you're in the creative real estate exchange marketing and you're not getting referral business and not getting repeat clients, you're doing something wrong because that's what it should all be about. Um, one of my good friends in one of the national groups has two or three clients. That's all he's had for 20 years. They just keep getting bigger and doing more business. He keeps getting busier and he should be getting ready to retire. But his clients won't let him go. Uh, Bob Brome, who some of you uh, knew, had three or four good clients. It's just over and over and over. Um, now, can you do that in the normal marketplace? Probably, but it's, it's easier and required almost through this marketplace. So uh, some of you that have had the course, like Joe, you've never seen this slide before, Joe. This is a new slide. Here's something Joe does. I hope you're doing it today. On the back of his um, handout, he writes down, good idea, learn this today. First time I've seen this. <laughs> he, he gives me good feedback. He's given it to him, but I say, Joe, I want to see your notes. What did you hear or learn today that you didn't hear or learn over the last 10, 15 years? So, um, if you see this little old baseball, this is kind of my historical slides. If, if you're an attorney, you want to know who invented the law. Who were the original people? If you're an architect, if you're a, a house painter, if you're a whatever, you want to know some history about your profession. So the, one of the organizations I belong to called Society of Exchange Counselors had their 60th anniversary last year. And I added these slides with the baseball mitt specifically for that historical event. So this is the guy 60 years ago that said there's more than one way to do real estate. We've all been taught to just focus on the sticks and bricks on the real estate. And he said, no, the people are the more important part. I would say they're equal. Real estate, people, but most of the real estate brokerage and industry doesn't focus on the people. They focus on the real estate. That's not all bad, but there's a better way to do it. Know everything you can know about the real estate. That's just a reminder. Thank you for whoever reminded us. Um, know all you can about the real estate, of course. But learn more about the people. So Richard Reno, we have a little form that we use in the marketing room. Uh, some of you don't even know it's called the Reno form. It's where you list what you have, what you want, what are the benefits, why do you want to go out of title. It's called the Reno form. 
Uh, Mr. Reno's been deceased for several years. But, but this is a, at this time, that could be today. At this time, everyone seems to be concerned with the future of everything. Is that, do you know where interest rates are going? Do you know what's going to happen? Are we going to have a recession, a depression, um, politics? Oh my goodness. Uh, we're concerned with the future of everything. We've been receiving calls from clients and other interested parties from all over the country with the question, what to do? All of you who are capable of counseling about their problems are being called upon and will be called upon more and more. So as things get in flux, this information is more important than when we know what's the, the crystal ball when it's clear, don't need as much of this counseling information. It always helps, but when things get a little foggy, a little cloudy, um, this is what, this is important. So today for some of you, you'll be hearing things that are totally different than anything that you've heard about how to market real estate. What I'd like for you to do is keep an open mind through the day. At the end of the day, closed mind again is okay with me. It just means you made a choice and any choice you make is fine. But try to keep an open mind. So a guy by Matt, Mark Van Dorn uh, wrote the book, uh, Prince and a Pauper. So the prince and the pauper changed clothes. You didn't know which was which. The pauper looked like a prince, the prince looked like a pauper. This idea of counseling and exchanging could be the prince. So in, in 1979 about, Ted Strawn, sitting in the back of the room, invited me to my first marketing meeting that looked like something different than I knew. And that became the prince. I took off the pauper's clothes and left them somewhere else. I put on new clothes. I started doing business differently. I started traveling to national meetings. And my life changed. Now, if I hadn't have done that, I'm not saying my life wouldn't have been good, okay, great, different, for sure. But I made that choice. So for the day, kind of keep um, wide open on uh, uh, options, ideas. So the 222, you were right about that 222. The first two hours will focus on the very basics of the exchange market also known as benefit-driven marketing. What are the differences from this to conventional brokerage? The whole day, all day, focuses on the most important part of the real estate transaction, the people. Some of you could disagree with that right now, and that's okay. The people aren't the most important thing, Ted. It's me getting my seller the price that they want on the, that we agreed on the listing agreement. That's the most important thing. Me understanding the property, how to value the property, how to understand the marketplace, and getting them the price that we contracted for. I don't really care that I need to know much about them as long as I accomplish selling the property. That's pretty much the normal thinking in, in the rest of the market. There's a different way, there's a better way, I think, uh, that can help you do more of that, not less of that. The second session will discuss the basics of real estate questioning and counseling. So once we determine at the first couple hours that there's a need for this information, how do you get it from a client? Your clients don't just walk in and start saying what's wrong with the property, what's wrong with this ownership, what's wrong with their partnership. They don't start there. They say, here's my real estate, list it and sell it. We need more information than that. Uh, so we'll uh, talk about the broker's challenge and responsibility of maximizing the client's benefits in their portfolio. 
Why is understanding the client's motivation so darn important? And then we're going to talk about real estate cycles. Um, how many in here are under 30? Never seen a real estate cycle. No. No, you have. I mean, like when I was a kid. I was yeah, you saw when you were a kid. <laughs> Kyla, thank you. Um, so probably under 35. How many have not been in real estate 10 years? You haven't seen a real estate cycle. Well, that's, but that, were you in real estate in 2008? But you knew something was going on. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just saying real estate cycles are real important, but a lot of us haven't really, don't know why or haven't seen them. We're going to spend a little bit of time on why the hair does turn gray. Uh, session three, we will expand the listening and questioning skills. We'll do a personal inventory on where you can improve your counseling skills, which is different than what we did this morning. Um, so did anything come out of this of value? Okay, the top of page three is where we should be. So... Think, uh, there is another way, other than just thinking about your real estate. Think of your prospective clients, not their real estate, as your inventory. So if I asked, how many listings do you have? You would go, okay, I got that property, that property, that. I've got four listings, four real estate listings. How many clients do you have? Could be the same number, one, two, three, four. Could be one. If you're in this room, it might be more likely one with four properties to sell. But think of your clients as your inventory, not just your real estate as your inventory. So there's many ways to market your listings. I listed a bunch of them there, social media and Craigslist and CoStar and MLS, etc. Then, the important question, what do brokers do when they've tried all the above marketing tools and we still don't have a contract acceptable to the seller? So we're two or three months into the listing. It's on multi-list, it's on LoopNet, it's on Crexy. I ran some ads. It's a million dollar property and I still don't have an acceptable offer. As a broker, brokers that don't know what we do, what's the most logical thing that I can do? Lucas? Try to persuade your client to lower the price or give up the listing. Lower the price or give up the listing. Different answer? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Same thing, Anna? Put up a sign? We already did that. We even called the neighbors, Anna. We did all the stuff we're supposed to do. You know how many of us don't call the neighbors first? Darn, we should do that every time. Tom? If you raise the price, you'll get a whole different group of buyers who have more money to spend. Change the price. Raise it, maybe. I, I just think that uh, you've got to look at the benefits and expand your marketplace. Like, what can I get with my willingness to trade this property? Yeah, but they don't know that. They haven't had the course. They don't know to, rate, to do what we're talking about today. What they do is an equity ectomy. Tonsillectomy means take it out. Equity ectomy. So our client has a million dollar property with 800,000 of debt. Hasn't sold in two months, three months. Nothing's happening. How much do you think we should lower the price? 
Somebody say 10%. 10%. Yeah, let's lower the price 10%, Mr. Seller, Mrs. Seller. Million dollar property, 800 debt, 200 equity. Let's lower it 100,000. Equity, ectomy. Half the equity just went away. That's not our job. Our job is to get them all their equity that they deserve. Now, if you listed a $900,000 property at a million, they never had that equity. But if it's listed right, if it's appraised, if it's feeling like that's the market, and it's just easier to get some offers, let's give our clients an equity ectomy. Are we doing the best for our clients if we give away their equity? I think not. If it needs to be lowered because it wasn't priced right, whole different question, but not an equity ectomy. Um, Roman numeral one, introduction. Um, I invite you to journey into an opportunity for growth, enter with an open mind, and try to learn something from each CE course. We'll talk about it later. One reason um, there aren't more courses available was when they established CE. Uh, I used to travel to courses 10, 15 states probably. I've been to a course to get this information. And none of them had CE. Now we all want CE or we're not going. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later too. Luckily, we've got this uh, with credit. Um, a cash flush, flush market versus a cash tight market, client-based counseling works in all. Uh, we'll see a slide a little later. As supply or as demand goes up, there's a lot more cash in the market and a limited supply. When there's a lot of cash and a little supply, which is kind of what we've been going through, client counseling is less important because you have so many cash buyers. If there's a cycle coming and there's more supply than demand, what we're learning in here will potentially keep you from leaving the market because you couldn't make a living. So supply and demand is important uh, for what we're talking about here. Um, I'll ask somebody for a war story, some of you older folks, uh, more experienced folks on a supply and demand issue in the last 30 years. Just somebody be ready. Um, so this is the godfather of real estate counseling. His name's uh, Chuck Chatham. He's the only one I know of that wrote a book on Counseling, Secrets of a Lucrative Real Estate Career. We'll talk about that later. But Chuck said, and Chuck is, all these guys are deceased, I'm sorry. I'm what's left. <laughs> you get me? Because <laughs> you don't get the best. The concept has always been that real estate is inventory, merchandise, and must be sold as though it were on our shelf. All of the other errors commonly made and condoned in today's real estate practice continue to feed and flourish on this premise that it's merchandise. If somebody walks into your shop and you have two listings and they're buying a house, you're going to show them those two listings because it's your merchandise on your shelf because that's how you get paid. I understand that. But neither one of those houses is what they need shouldn't even show it to them. You should go find what they need. But this is the way a lot of real estate is. It's the merchandise that I have is what I'm going to sell. 
these definitions require an attitude completely foreign to the modern broker, that's you. They require a listening, questioning, questioning, probing attitude, which is diametrically opposed to the attitude believed necessary to be in salesmanship. So we're not salesmen. Some of us take negotiating courses. Some of us have taken sales courses. There's good information there, but we're not just trying to sell, sell, sell. We're trying to solve a client's problem. Chuck also says, inventory, the real estate industry can never become a profession in the true sense as long as we bow our knees to inventory. Uh, and in, when he'd teach a class, it was a four-day class. Somebody get out your calculator. In 1977, I took this course in Wheat Ridge. I was living in Grand Junction at the time, but traveled here, got a hotel room for three nights, and um, enjoyed the course. It was $275, and it was four days of your time. So let's plug in 1977 to today. Well, first go 2022 minus 80. How many years is that? 45. So two, 275 is present value. Time is 45 years. Uh, let's use uh, 4 or 5% inflation. How much would that course cost today? About 3,000 bucks. 3,000, but he doesn't have a calculator. Lucas is running it. Uh, I don't know how to do that. Come on, there's got to be a CCIM in here. Should be. Financial calculator, Ray's going to get it out. 275, 45 years, 5%. 2,500, you guessed 3,000, that's pretty close. So would you spend 2,500 for me for one day? Or let's divide it by four? I don't think so. I mean, 50 was like a stretch. <laughs> anyway. Um, if you should raise the price. There's a good idea. But I'd rather talk to 50 than three, so we'll leave it kind of inexpensive. And that's part of the problem with continuing ed. It's just cheapened everything. Um, so technology, we're in a new world. Um, not for you, I mean, we've been in this world for 10, 15 years, but it continues to change. Technology is changing how the public uses and looks at real estate professionals. Technology is changing how we list and market real estate. It's changing how we communicate with each other. Uh, does anybody have a listing where their client does not live near them or here in Colorado? Okay. How far away is your farthest client? Um. Phoenix or Silicon Valley? Phoenix is good. Durango. Anybody farther than Phoenix? Texas. Okay, how often do you see that client? I've never met him. Never met him because? He was referred by Tom DeSolibre. Well, because you don't need to meet. Right. Right? Did all the forms get signed? Yeah. Yeah, forms can get signed. Did you send them all the properties that are for sale or whatever they were buying or selling or no, we get all the stuff for their listing yeah we can we can do it all here now what's the what's the problem with that in relation to what we're talking about today no connection what's the problem with that it's not as personal Loud. not as personal not as personal it's hard to get that personal relationship hard to develop a relationship and the un, unspoken vocabulary. The unspoken vocabulary, which is, you what? <laughs> it's the body language. Body language. So technology is great, but if you're trying to do everything through technology and not counseling with your client, is tough. I've, I've not 
done a deal with a client in Australia. That was part of the problem. <laughs> they were in Australia and I was here and we just, it didn't ever connect. I've not done a deal with a client in Denver. So you cannot be successful or you can be successful and not do counseling. But if you do counseling with a client face to face, you will be more successful and will close more deals. So that's part of what we're trying to uh, get across here today. So, uh, D, as a lister or seller of real estate, what one thing do you need more than anything else to create a transaction or a fee? You have a listing, it's signed, the signs are up, it's in multi-list. What do you need to create a sale? Taker. Taker. Cindy, what do you need to create a sale? Uh, what was that word? To sell. What was that? You already got that. It was that word that you learned this morning. Taker. You need a taker. You need a buyer if it's a cash sale. If you don't have a buyer, you need somebody that wants to own it some way, somehow. And we're, we'll talk a lot about being a taker and finding takers. So a fellow by the name of Broadbent, good friend, also not living. I have a lot of good friends, Joe, that just aren't living anymore. There's a trend. It's a trend. Some of you might not be living before long. Okay. He invented this little house thing. I couldn't quite get it up here, so this is, this is his little house thing. And um, Broadbent was nationally known. I think he was like the second or third CCIM and... SEC, Society of Exchange Counselor, in the country. Um, and he used to teach um, client representation. What's that called? What's a better client rep work? Um, pardon? Agency. Big on that 50, 60 years ago. Represent one side. Get a listing on your buyer. Represent just your seller. Get another broker to represent the buyer single agency. So I said one title for the course could be how to broaden the market uh, for your property or for your client. Of the newer people who has a listing that maybe we could help you market today, there's nothing wrong with us doing business here, who has a listing that is for sale? It's a for sale listing and your client is expecting you to bring all cash to the closing and take title. Newer people who has a for sale listing. Yes. Christina. I'm coming back. For some reason the volunteers are towards the back of the room. Introduce yourself and speak real clearly into that. My name is Christina. Uh, I'm from uh, KWDTC. And my listing is, uh, I don't know if they're expecting a cash offer. I mean, it would be nice, of course. But um, it's a $1.1 $1 million listing in Conifer. Um, and it's been up uh, for about two and a half weeks. We're getting showings, but no interest. And part of it is the updates that are needed, uh, younger buyers tend to shy away from that, so. Okay, but you've got a million one property for sale and no offers yet, okay. So the number of cash buyers, are they somewhat limited or unlimited? They're limited, there's, 
I don't know what that first number is, but maybe there's 10. And they don't all know about the property because there's no way to get everybody to know about your property. So Christina's got a few cash buyers maybe that are looking, but nobody stood up and, and saluted. So in order to expand the market, Christina, we're going to give you some ideas because if you've had how many lookers? I think we're at six showings at the moment. We've had six showings. Does that mean she has six takers? Potentially. No, but out of those six, I bet there's one taker. If you knew for sure what they were trying to do, wanting to do, needing to do. But what could Christina's client do to expand the market because right now she's asking for a million one cash at closing. What's one thing she could ask her client to do to expand the marketplace? Not yet. You save that. What's easier? I'm not calling on you long term, guys. Pardon? All cash is, includes bank financing. Bank financing is all cash to the seller. Who said that? Seller Asher. Hi, Asher. I didn't even see you. Owner carry financing. How much debt is against the property, Christina? Uh, they are at 350 is what they owe, but they are going to downsize and buy another property. Okay, but they have 350 debt, okay? So Asher said, if they would own or carry, let's say they said, well, if you can get us 350 down, we'll pay off our bank loan and we'll carry 750. You've probably not had that discussion with them, have you? No, you wouldn't, shouldn't have. But if they would own or carry and I don't have to go to the bank because I hate banks because I had a, a bankruptcy a few years ago um, because of a lot of reasons people just don't like dealing with banks. So if your buyer could buy with notes or owner carry, more people can qualify. So we've increased our number of takers by 50% or some percentage and owner carry folks is coming back into the market quickly. It's already here and it's going to be more because the bank rates went up. Um, I've got a client right now who offered on a four and a half million dollar property. Um, the property was a 5% cap rate deal. The loan quoted to him was five and a half. Guess what doesn't work? Five cap rate properties with a five and a half percent loan. And a loan constant, you don't all know what a loan constant is. Who doesn't know what a loan constant? Okay, I'll talk to Sean. Five and a half percent is the interest. Amortization of two or three percent Add that to the interest is the loan constant. So if a loan has amortization, you don't have to cover five and a half percent, you have to cover seven or eight percent. That's the constant. So I have five percent income coming in, I got eight percent going out, it doesn't work. You know what he offered to the seller? More money. <laughs> Increase the price, owner carry financing at cheap owner carry financing. So you can offer 4.8 on a $4 million property at a 3% interest rate for 30 years and make the cash flow work. Owner carry financing is coming back. Christina, let's say your buyers said, we won't owner carry for whatever reason. We have to have 
our money to go into, go into the, sorry, right, this next house. What's the next question that Christina could be asking her client to expand the market? What property do you want? What kind of property do you want? Where do you want it? What benefits do you need? With a house, it's kind of tough to do simultaneous exchanges, although the first exchange I did, I lived in Grand Junction. I had to move to Denver because I couldn't make a living in 1982 in Grand Junction or 85. And there was a guy that worked for the Yellow Pages, lived in Denver, that got transferred to Grand Junction. His broker said, Ted, are you interested in their house? What did Ted say? Yes. Did I go look at it first? Uh-uh. It didn't make any difference, Ray. I had to move because yeah. I'd been driving back and forth on the weekend to Denver, and I had two kids, one and three, and a wife <laughs> that I wanted to keep. We loaded up our U-Hauls, and we went like this over the mountain the same weekend, and I took his house. Mr. Strawn, do you remember that first house? What was it close to? Do you remember? Yeah, it was close to a, a very large highway, uh, uh, 525. Interstate 25 was my backyard without that big fence that they put. You couldn't sit on the back porch. You were happy for about five minutes. No. <laughs> no. I didn't like some things about the house, but it gave me the benefits that I needed which was a geographic move. So it's hard to do that with houses. But do we know where they want to move to? I'm sorry, there's a mute button and you have to push the mute button if it's off. Just hold it until you see, see it come on. Just push the mute button. I bet it works, honestly, because I had trouble with it, too. Well, they want to go to Centennial because... Okay, they want a house in Centennial. Okay. Are there any houses in Centennial for sale? <laughs> yes. Okay. So if we knew what they wanted, where they wanted it, and if they would consider, oh, I'll take a $500,000 house in Centennial as a down payment on my million one that would expand the marketplace. So if we would look at takers with property, we can expand the marketplace. No matter how much cash there is out there, there's more equity than there is cash. There's more equity in the marketplace for exchange, for sale, than there is cash looking for your property. So if you can happen to find a group that deals in properties for exchange, you can get an offer on most every property that you've had for a while. So let's say we found a house in Centennial. We think they might take that. What, let's say they have this listing for another three months. And, and for some reason, they're getting highly motivated. And we can't find a house in Centennial. What else might we ask them in month six what they might do to expand the marketplace? Let's say they need out of the loan. They can't make the loan payment. They've got to get out of the loan. I mean, we're making this up as we go. Lucas? Somebody who could buy it subject to existing financing or on a wrap? Okay, that's still owner carry financing. They will take a house in Centennial. What else could we ask them? Oh, wow. personal property. Personal property or property anywhere. Or, yeah. So somebody comes up with a $300,000 condo in Florida as a down payment on their property. They're going to say, we're not moving to Florida. Well, you don't have to move to Florida. We'll rent it. But if they'll take property and be geographically flexible, you expand the marketplace. Now, for you residential only people, this is a stretch. For you investment people, this is not a stretch at all. This happens all the time. But we don't ask our clients if they will do some of these things. 
We don't know what their abilities, we don't know what their inabilities, we don't know what their motivations are. So one other thing that they could do would be to actually add cash and move up to another property, not in residential normally, it's not, that, that formula doesn't work. In our marketing room, happens all the time. Got a half a million dollar property, how big can you go? That's the first question. Can they go up to a million? Could they go to two million? So adding cash. Potential takers can disappear because of a seller's inflexibility. The only thing worse than a seller's inflexibility is a broker's inability to find out that they're inflexible. Can you find out what your clients will and won't do? Barbara, did we get our microphone working? Okay. Well, it may be a few minutes, so have a seat. There are many more takers with notes or equities than cash buyers. Let's see how far behind we are. Oh my gosh. We're way behind. Um, F, the only thing better than a taker at a certain value is a taker at a higher value. Here's Mr. Broadbent. Uh, the sale of a listing doesn't begin until a prospect says, yes, I'd like to own that property. I'm a taker. When a taker says, yes, I will take it, that's when the broker's work starts. Last paragraph, this is important. If you've had, and now I'm talking to the more experienced and intermediate people, if you've had takers, but haven't been closing as many transactions as you would like, perhaps you need to sharpen your skills by taking some courses in creative real estate problem solving. So if you're marketing your property, five people are saying, we want to own it. None of those are all cash, full price offers. And you can't figure out, well, no, 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 no. You need to figure out how to work with those offers to get your clients the benefits they seek. We're not trying to give your clients something that doesn't move them forward. If we can't offer something that doesn't move them forward, they won't move, and they shouldn't. But if we can show them something that's beneficial and allows them to go forward, then they should say, yeah, I'll look at that. But we need to know the formulas to make that work. Uh, just a quickie. This is the way I used to market. We'd take a lot of time, visit with visit with our clients, then the computer came along and it just got real crazy all of a sudden. Lots, lots happening. Okay, some of you that maybe aren't beginners, what's the difference between um, exchanging creative marketing and conventional marketing? What are the differences? I'm ready. Benefits are more important. I can't hear you. Benefits are more important. What should be? Benefits. And or people are more important. Benefits. People. Focus on the equity. People versus property. I'm going to say benefits sought. What are you going to do with the money? Benefits sought versus benefits offered uh, the difference is uh, it's a good question um, I don't know how to write it up here on the differences I guess it's finding out so let let's say just uh, uh, deeper understanding of client need. 
so what are you going to do with the money? Well, I think I'm going to go buy a larger commercial property. Uh, what's your basis in your property? Um, oh, you don't have any gain? What, why are you doing a 1031? Oh, you have a lot of gain? Why aren't you doing a 1031? Understanding your client, what are they going to do with the money? Um, let's say they have a, an estate uh, that has five brothers and sisters in five different parts of the country. Cash is the best way to handle that problem. You're not going to find five properties that the five are going to take. It's never happened in the history of exchanging. <laughs> but we keep trying. We keep trying, don't we? We say, let's give them five lots. They can each have a lot. And four of them will take them, and the one will be a holdout. That's right. It's always a challenge. What are the differences between conventional marketing? I'd say creativity. Upside the box. So I'm just going to call that formulas. Formulas, yeah. Right. What are the differences between conventional and what we do in this room on Wednesday mornings? Counseling. Counseling, okay. I need one more and I won't. So I would say it's more, it's less adversarial than conventional brokerage. How about cooperation versus competition? Yeah. So if, I don't want to bang on the big houses, but I always do. If you work at a big house, you get a listing, the first thing you do is go to your two favorite buyers, two favorite brokers, to see if they have a buyer that can do a deal in-house. And you keep the information kind of like this, pretty, pretty tight. In our marketing, you walk into the room with a brand new listing and you go like this. Here's everything I know. Help me do a deal. Help me find a buyer. If I don't trip over this cord today, it'll be amazing. Let's amaze somebody. People versus inventory, benefits. See, this is a pretty smart group. They know the answers. Client motivation, broker cooperation versus competition, problem solving, takers versus buyers. And that's different. For those of you that are new in here today, a lot of that is different because you didn't really have to know the motivation, particularly of the house seller. You had to know that the house is priced right and that you can get them $567,000. That's what you needed to know. I, I would suggest these other things will help you in the future, but you maybe didn't have to know that in the past and your broker didn't really want you to know or care about that. They want you to get the listing. I understand that. If I ran a big shop, that's probably the way I'd run it. But I don't have a big shop. How many employees we got, Ray? Not too many. Not too many. So exchanging, you cannot do it with one, two, or three without all three of the legs. Anybody ever milk cows? There's got to be somebody milked a cow. You have one of those stools you sit under the cow? <laughs> Three-legged milk stool. So today we're talking about one leg. You will not come out of here being an exchange person if you weren't when you came in. You will know one-third of what you need to know. Exchanging and taxes are, why do we do this? You're getting a little bit of that today. We're going to talk about 1031s. We're going to talk about capital gain. But you need a whole day course or two on exchanging and taxation to put with the counseling. But as important as any of these, and maybe more for some, are the formulas. Because 
if I know that I need to be looking at this different way of marketing, I kind of understand the taxation side. I understand 1031, I understand simultaneous exchanging, which is one property for another. It's not a facilitator, it's not 45 days. If I understand that, then I go to my client and I get all the information out of their head into my head. I need to know everything about them that affects this real estate decision. If I got that and that and I don't know how to put the deals together, I won't be successful. If any one of these is missing, without counseling and knowing everything that the client's abilities and inabilities, all the formulas in the world won't work. If you haven't developed rapport, they don't want to listen to a formula about owner carrier trading for a house in Florida because you haven't developed the rapport, which is what counseling. Uh, this is Mr. Reno again, the founder. Ray and I always get into this valuing a property because Ray's an appraiser. Ray's going to know what the value and the price is. But Mr. Reno says, Mr. Reno says, it's meaningless, Ray. It's just plain meaningless. Price, value, and worth have to be connected to an owner, to a person. The mere existence of a parcel of property has nothing to do with price, value, or worth. The question should always be, what will that property do for somebody, the current owner or the next owner? Now, does anybody know what an unpriced listing is? Cleve. Unpriced listing, what yeah, is I mean, typically on a package we put WETV, whatever the value, and it basically, you can take a listing, it doesn't have to have a price because then it gets people's focus off of value, whether it's high priced or low priced, it's really about the benefits. And so if you go in there and you can get people to not be thinking about the price, then you open yourself up to a lot more potential offers because people aren't fixated. In the market that we've just been through, price didn't make much difference anyway. Right. Because people would bid it up or down to get to the price they wanted. But an unpriced listing, imagine going to a market, let's say this is a marketing meeting and we all had a property to present, every one of us and not one of them had a price in the upper right hand corner. Might have the debt, maybe put the debt on there, but no price. Would you be more or less interested in that property if it gave you the benefits that you saw it? I'd look at it. Yeah, you'd wanna look at it. Now, yes, something that I use a lot in the business and someone says, well, how much do you want for your property? I said, well, I'll take a nickel provided I can buy what I want for a nickel. <laughs> the value really, is irrelevant, it's really a question of what I can yeah. do with whatever value has been established. And we've got clients that say, I want a million dollars, but I'm not gonna sell it until I find out what I can buy for that million dollars. Exactly the same thing. Thank you. So that's an unpriced listing concept, um, but appraisers have to come up with a number. We as brokers sometimes have to come up, most of the time, come up with a number. How many times, though, have you looked at a package on LoopNet and there's no price? It says call the broker. That's kind of an unpriced listing, but they're just wanting to get interest. Who's, they're wanting to see who's a taker. Any questions on that? Worth, we're gonna talk about price, cost, worth, benefits, value, all of that. Let's look at uh, price. A, price is a numerical measure that Ray comes up with at a current point in time. It's a way to keep score. It's better for a seller. More is better for a seller. Less is better for the buyer. 
it always creates an adversarial contest and a win-lose. Most commerce is completed through this win-lose negotiating process. Price is the amount asked to divest one's ownership interest. So the price of Christina's property was a million one, if I recall. That's the list price. So what's the cost? The cost is the amount paid to make or acquire the item. Why is that important? It's not important in Christina's deal, probably, because it's a private residence that probably has a lifetime exclusion or Price determines the amount at which I'm willing to sell and also determines how much property I can go forward and buy with. Okay, why is cost important? Well, the cost determines, uh, well, it, it affects how much, how much I can develop the property or how much it took to develop that property. So, so that would determine my return. You've got a price of a million, right. an offer of a million. Okay. That tells you what you can go forward with. Right. But it cost you 400000 10 years ago. Why do you care about that? Well, that tells me how much tax I'm going to pay in capital gains. Okay. Thank you. So cost is important. And a lot of us don't know what our clients cost. Or another word for that is basis. Basis is affected not only by what you pay, but also by this side of the room. Depreciation comes off a of basis. Capital improvement to the property, new roof, adds to the basis. Appreciation or depreciation? I meant to say depreciation. Did I say appreciation? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, let's go to exhibit A1. Exhibit A1. And uh, real quick, fill that out. Get, get out your calculators. So let's start at the top and do this together. You bought a property five years ago for 600,000. That's the cost. You bought it for 600,000. You used 1031 exchange money into the property, which had a basis of 300,000. And you added cash of 100 and you had transaction cost of 10,000. What is your original basis? Did anybody get to that number? 310. I hear 410 and I like 410. So, if you buy with 1031 money, you move your old basis. I mean, you're taking a listing and you know they paid 600, but you have no idea where the 600 came from. Was any of it 1031 money? If so, what was your basis? So there's 300 of your basis. You added new money, that's new basis. And you added cost, that's new basis. So your basis is 410. That's an important number. That'll be on the quiz later. Now you add a new um, uh, warehouse, addition for $100,000 and over time you depreciated at $75,000. What is your adjusted basis? 435, I like that number. Now five years later it's 435, that's the 410 plus 25,000 which is the difference between your capital improvements and your depreciation. You add on capital improvements, you deduct depreciation from your basis. Today you're selling it for a million. You have debt of 600. What is your adjusted basis? That hadn't changed. Shout it out again. 435, fill that number in. You have 50,000 of closing cost. What is your capital gain? Oh, I heard a good number. 335. 
515. So your current sales price minus your transaction cost is 50. So you're starting with 950 minus 435 basis is your capital gains of 515. Why is that an important number with you and your client? Tax consequences. Louder? Capital gains. Tax consequences. So that's the tax consequences. And now we're going to figure it. If that number was zero, what would the discussion be with you and your client, or what could it sound like? You don't need a 1031. You don't need a 1031. How about if that number's 50? Probably better off not to. If you gotta go up to a million, why screw with it to pay tax on 50? Joseph. You may still have a bad though because of relief of debt. Joe's getting Course two, advanced course. Release, relief of debt is a possible, possible issue. Uh, debt exceeding basis is a worse issue. But this is not a tax course. Remember the three-legged stool? That's a different course. We're doing a little bit of the easy stuff. So what's the tax on capital gain? 20%, 103,000. I think I've figured these right. Just write in 103,000. What's the tax on their depreciation? We had 75,000 of depreciation. Recapture tax is at 25%. That's 18,750. Colorado has a 4.5% state tax gain. That's 23,432. The Obama Affordable Health Care Plans, 3.8% that most people pay. That's 19,570. Total tax is somewhat like 164,000. For some people, capital gain is 25% if they make enough money. So you need a tax course. So at the end of the day, the discussion with your client is, if we sell this $600,000 property, you're going to have $164,000 tax to pay if you don't do something to minimize or avoid that. What's two ways to minimize, three ways to minimize or avoid that $164,000 tax? Installment sale. An installment sale takes some money down now, some money later. That's in the tax course. You defer that tax on the money you don't take today. You don't save it, you just defer it. What's another way to defer the tax? You could, um, you could carry back a note. That's an installment sale. Okay, I thought you meant like contract for deed installment sale versus the... Yeah, same thing, okay. for tax purposes. Say at least with an option to buy. We're going to sell it. We're going to sell it. 1031 exchange means you can buy another... <laughs> Shane. Like. Shane, come up. Shane's our 1031 expert. I shouldn't be telling you this. We're selling, we're selling, we're sell. oh, where's Ken? Shane's a banker. Sit down. Where's Ken? Ken's not here. I'll go ahead and do this. You know what? I used to get embarrassed about these foo paws that I made. I'm over it. You already forgot about it. Huh? You forgot about it. I already forgot about it. So the two golfers were out there. The one guy couldn't see, so he took his friend along who had great eyesight. He hits the ball. He says, where'd it go, George? George goes, I saw it, but I don't remember. <laughs> I don't know. Um, 1031, um, investing in a, starts with a V, I think. V, F. Well, Vulture, Venture. Venture, yeah. Not Venture. What is it? Where uh, 
OC? What? OC? Opportunity zone. OZ, opportunity zone, will defer the taxes. So there's, there's a variety of ways. Um, now, um, what's the total cash available to the seller at closing date? Did anybody figure that? 235. I didn't hear the right number yet. Before after taxes. <laughs> now, this is at closing, not after you pay your tax. At closing. Three hundred thousand for no sales. Four hundred less is fifty in transaction yeah, costs. So he's got three hundred and fifty. I would accept that answer. Three hundred and fifty thousand. So at closing, the seller's getting three fifty, and a tax bill coming due of one sixty four. Now, this is the important question. Should the client? move forward with a 1031 exchange. 350 cash in their pocket, 164,000 tax bill coming. Should they do a 1031 exchange? Everybody that thinks yes, raise your hand. How about probably? Everybody that thinks no, raise your hand. Everybody that thinks maybe, <laughs> it depends, raise your hand. Now, I understand why a lot of people would say yes. And that's nine out of 10 times might be the answer. But what would be an example where they would not do a 1031, even though they had this tax bill coming in April? Or it, it could be the five siblings who can't get along and everybody just, whatever cash it is, give me my cash. They go on. So they've got a partnership they have to divide up, and cash is the best way, easiest way to do it. They could have a huge loss from something else in the tax code. Bingo. So they've got a loss from something else that'll eat up this gain. Yeah, the, Sean, the deal Sean <laughs> Yeah, Sean's deal. <laughs> Lucas. They might have a tax bill from their income tax they just have to pay now. Like, uh, yeah. I got 150 in taxes I have to pay. So I don't care about the 1031 because I don't want to go to jail. So any immediate cash need could be a, an operation to help your spouse live another 20 years. You maybe need the cash more than you don't want the tax bill. Let's say I had a partner call me in 2009. He had about three hundred plus thousand dollar interest in one of our properties, and he says, "Cleve, you pay me 175 thousand dollars today for it." Well, of course I will. And if that's the number he needed he to needs. solve all of his problems and financial problems in life, and I didn't have to negotiate with him. He did it for us. So Cleve's saying if the cash need is today, for whatever that need is, it's more important than the upside of doing another deal. So, okay. Now, uh, this is an adult education if you need to go to the bathroom it's that way okay okay why are these guys important to you because they're the ones that invented the exchanging program that we have. look like farmers reno stuff there huh is that one of those reno not reno the not Chatham. <laughs> it looks like farmers. So I'm guessing they probably they are farmers trading property to grow and fix their stuff. They were farmers of timber. 1031. 1031. Timber farmers sold to Zock Zillerback or somebody, big timber company, in 1970. Their name was Starker. Half of you don't know that name, and that's okay. It's a 20-year-old name. But this is 1031 exchanging, all came out of these three, four guys. Mr. Starker, uh, second from the left, and his three sons, who uh, P.V. Hall is a you know, at the University of Washington or Oregon, wherever they have a lot of uh, timber uh, training. Um, and in, this was in 19, 
79 is when IRS approved the non-simultaneous exchange. Starker sold their timber, a big timber company put the money in escrow, and when Starker found a property he wanted, the timber company went and bought it for him. They bought 10 or 11 properties for Mr. Starker, and the IRS said, that's not legal, you can't do that. And it went through appeals and uh, the Supreme Court, and Starker finally won. Thank goodness. So that's the first non-simultaneous. But when were simultaneous 1031s approved? 1921. Oh, it was like 1921. 1921, he got it. Woohoo! That's wonderful. So, <clears throat> um, in fact, 1921, you could do exchanges. They didn't even have to be like kind. So you could do uh, sell a piece of real estate and buy horses. So um, you could buy anything that was investment. 1935, they changed that to like kind with the same kind of definition we have today. 79 was starker. That's when it was overturned. Um, they had the sale like in 71. And then 1990, what happened in 1990 regarding 1031? Do you all need property? Real property? Reverse? Uh, yes, no. And what are all the rules and regulations we have to follow? follow? Yeah, that's when all. 45 days, 180 days, reverse exchange, all that stuff. Yeah, but this, didn't this exchange take years? before you got his last property? And yeah, but oh, Starker did, yeah. Yeah, but the IRS defined it versus going right. by the general court uh, precedent. That Until 1990, we didn't have a 45-day, 180-day rule. I wish they'd have never done that. It's made our lives tougher. Has anybody ever represented a client who sold a property and you were responsible for finding the replacement property? That is not a fun place to be for 45 days. It, I call it the pressure cooker. That's, it's, it is not good for the client or you. It's better if you go to the NCD, NCD meetings quarterly, though. If you go to a national meeting quarterly, Lucas says, that will help you get, find those properties. But it's also smarter to when your client comes and says, will you help me sell this property? You're in January, and you go, what's your gain? What's your basis? What's your, what are you going to do with the money? Well, I think I'm going to da 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 and, and are you going to want me to help you find a replacement property? What kind of property? Okay, so let's list it now in January. Let's start looking now in January for the replacement property if this is reasonably saleable. So start today looking for that. So the 45 days is maybe six months because 45 days doesn't start till you close. So you mark it for two to three months, you close for two to three months, you identify for 45 days, you close in 180, it takes a year. But if you don't start looking until you close, that's not a fun, place to be. Okay, and if you can afford to do in a reverse exchange, it makes life so much easier. And then you have a motivated seller once you put the We need a need a microphone, Shane, I'm sorry. Because this is important. This is part of the tax course, isn't it? That, the, that we're not getting. Go ahead. Yeah. Well basically if you can locate the replacement property first and close on it through an intermediary now you have your property in place that as soon as you sell your property, you can do pretty much a simultaneous exchange with your replacement property. The good side of it is now you have a motivated seller because when you already have your replacement property locked and loaded, you're willing to negotiate more on the other end to get rid of the old property and move into the property you've already identified. And that, now you're out of the pressure cooker because you've already got your replacement property. So. I'll say it a little bit different. 
your client comes to you and says, I'm going to sell, you go, do you know what you want to buy? Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and buy it so it doesn't disappear in the marketplace and then sell the property that you own now. That's all done through the facilitator, through the intermediary. So you buy what you want before you sell what you got. It's called a reverse exchange. That's not change. <laughs> Did I do it again? No, no, I'm joking. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so Mr. Starker was quite a deal 40 years ago, less so today. Okay, D, benefits. Something that aids or promotes the well-being to be useful or profitable to aid, advance, and improve. So giving your client benefits is a good thing. Something that aids or promotes your client's well-being. Well benefits can be any fact, action, feature, or interpretation that promotes your client's well-being. So we're selling property for money we're buying the next property for the benefits that that property gives us, which will take money to buy those benefits. But how many times do we know the benefits that our client is seeking? We don't a lot of times, unless we counsel with them. Ray, pay attention. Okay. This is mainly for you. Value is the sum of the benefits. Value is the sum total of all the benefits to be enjoyed, less the sum total of all the detriments to be endured, which varies with each individual and their constantly changing circumstances. This is a better definition than, value, than price, cost, worth, Value is what we're talking about. Value to somebody. So read that again, because this is, this is very important. If you don't get this, it's kind of like, well, this thing didn't make sense. Value varies with each individual, and they're constantly changing circumstances, which means the value today is different than the value it was when they bought it, and the value five years from now, because their circumstances changed. Next slide. So, can the back of the room read that? Okay, just, they're, these guys' circumstances kind of are changing. They're, what they want to do with their life is changing. So we have a, an ideal exchange coming here between two, two parties. Um, let's go to exhibit B. This is the exhibit behind A1 and before C. Exhibit B. We normally do this as a class exercise. It's one of my favorites, but we just don't have time today. But take a, take a look at that. And, and here's what we normally do is... We list here the things that you like the most. So if you have time and want to, do it at home. So if the main thing that you like is free and clear, triple net, five cap properties, if that's the number one thing, and a lot of people like that, that would go right up here, number three. If the second thing you like the most is free and clear houses, you'd put a seven right there. If the thing you like least is uh, gold, silver, metal, and gems, you don't even put it on here because you got 14 of these. So you don't have to use four of them. So you list the stuff you like the best to the stuff you like the least to four items you don't even ever want to see on your balance sheet. 
This is for you, the brokers in the room. But do this with your client and your client's spouse. Do this with your client and your client's partner. And see if they value things the same. Anybody in here married to somebody in the room? Do have any married in the room? Okay, that's always the best. You get a married couple to do this. And they're both in the business. I mean, they, they both work on it. And you have her give her answers, and he's going, <laughs> or just the opposite. They don't, we don't think alike. We don't value things the like. If we could have Ray value each one of these and say they're all worth a million, we wouldn't care. I'll take any of them worth a million. Goes to cash at a million. I'm okay with that. So this is very good to use with clients. And when we do it here, there's a very wide, diverse answer uh, list of issues here. Or, anyway, that's normally a lot of fun, but it takes 15 minutes. There's two of these exhibits in here. That wasn't a mistake. One was to fill out and one was to take home with you. In order to maximize our client's value, we must clearly understand the motivations of our client. What does our listing agreement say about motivations? What does our listing agreement say about motivations? Not to discuss them. Yeah, do not discuss motivations. This course is about motivations. This is going to be tough if we can't talk about motivations. So, unless you get a written release that says, my broker may talk about my motivations, and there's a release form in here that you should not use, but it'll give your attorney something to look at. So why do they tell us not to discuss our clients' motivations? This side of the room. So that we don't divulge it to the other parties. So what types of things would you not want to put out to the market about your client? Some negative motivation. Louder. Bankruptcy, Bankruptcy, foreclosure, divorce, health. And why don't we divulge that? Because the other side might take advantage of that information. Now, if my client says, Ted, I got six months to live, and I want to live it well, would you let everybody know that I need an offer and I don't want to wait six months for the offer? I'll let them know. Sign right here that says I can do that. Once we understand the motivations, we as brokers can seek to find the benefits which solve the problems or fulfill the motivation. So we have to understand the motivations so that we can go find the benefits that they seek. And that's uh, number F. Right below that, motivation equals direction and velocity. I've not seen it put that way until just recently. But it's the direction we want to go and the speed at which we need to go there. So, my motivation, Ray, is to get out of my million dollars debt. Can you help me with that? Sure. What would your next question be, Ray? How fast do you want out? When's that loan due? How fast do you... <laughs> That's the velocity question. Well, Ray... It was kind of like due last month. Well, that's velocity. That's about a nine. Yeah. Let's get going, right? Well, it's, I got a year. Okay. Different answer. Yeah, that might be a four or five. Yeah. So motivation is direction and velocity. Motivation moves the client towards the desired benefit. We've got three identical properties here. Three office condos with a little warehouse in the back. These are in the tech center. 
Um, these are, let me use this word several times, identical. Did you get that? These are identical, Lucas. Okay. That means that they're the same size. That means they're built out the same. That means the tenants are the same. That means that the income is the same. That means that the debt is the same. They are identical. Okay. They're 2,000 feet. Uh, they have 20,000 income. Identical. Somebody give me a value of what that would be in your mind. 2,000 feet, 20,000 income, value. 4 million. 400,000. Thank you. 400,000. I will accept that number. Ray, what's the value of this one? 400,000. You're doing better, Ray. What's the value of this one, Ray? Don't say end cap on me. What's the value of this one, Ray? 400,000. All right. We've been through this before, haven't we? <laughs> How would you market these? You got the listing on one of these. How would you market it? Call the neighbor. Call the neighbor. Excellent. Go to the exchange meeting. Excellent. I don't know what you'd tell them at the exchange meeting, but what? Put a sign on it. Put a sign on it. What? Post it online. Absolutely post it online, everywhere you can. Remember all those horses running around? Po do all that stuff, because we're supposed to do that stuff, to expose it to the marketplace. So we do all of that. But what would we do different if we knew anything about the owners? This one's owned by Daddy Warbucks. Who's the richest guy in Denver? Anschutz. This one's owned by the widow. Well, Cronkies might. Yeah, I don't know who's the richest. This one's owned by a bank because they made a loan on a development deal and they took this as additional collateral and the whole deal blew up. The bank foreclosed. They're all free and clear. They're all leased. They're all $400,000. You go to the exchange marketing group. You talk about the benefits of the real estate, which are 20,000, free and clear, nice property, tech center. Okay, and you might get a $400,000 offer. But then the moderator, who's the person asking questions of the presenter, says, well, let's spend a little bit of time on the ownership. See if that can help create more interest. And you say, well, the owner used to be Mrs. Blank's husband, <laughs> but he's deceased. And now I own it, and I don't want any management, and I just want out. Just get rid of it. We did get a stepped up basis because he died in a timely manner. We won't talk about stepped up basis because that's in the tax course. You go, oh, well, what might work for the widow blank? Here, installment sale. Installment sale might be really nice. Just get a check every month. What else might work? Trade for a triple net. Exchange into a house. Trade for a triple net. Cash might work. What are you going to do with the cash, Mrs. Blank? Oh, I'll give it to the stockbroker and let him slowly lose it. I don't know. Now, oh, my client is Phil Anschutz. Da, 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 da. Really? What's Phil doing these days? Well, he, he'd really like a new ranch in Wyoming to go with his other ranch in Wyoming. I know a guy with a $10 million ranch, Ted. Do you think Phil would look at that? Oh, yeah, probably. Yeah. Is he capable? Mm, yeah. Uh, you know what this is going to end up being? Commission. <laughs> Commission. Or down payment, because the ranch guy at 10 million will sure take this 400, even if he has to discount it to 350 to sell it in a week. So, what do we do if we're the bank? This is our client. They wants to get rid of it. They can't keep it on their books. Can't keep it on the books. It's already owed. So, discount it? Maybe? Discount it, get it gone. So, the motivation of the one was it's yeah, probably higher. The properties have not changed. Please understand that today. People make 
decisions. Properties just sit there. They wait for their owner to tell them what to do. The property has not changed. The ownership has. Now, if that one didn't work, you got a bigger property. Same thing. Counsel with your clients. Bob Steele, who's one of our founders of this organization and still living. Ramon, where are you? Uh, Ramon needs the mic. He just doesn't know it yet. Uh, Bob Steele says there are three things you need to do a deal. Right here. You got to have motivation. I had a broker call me. Do you have the mic? We need the mic. I had a broker call me from Santa Fe that said, Ted, I'm working with a client. I think you can help us um, market this through the exchange marketplace. Uh, it's a $12 million house in Santa Fe. He's got $12 million in it. He said, who's the owner? Don't tell anybody, but he's computer guy. We all know. I said, I'd like to have a listing with that guy. That'd look good on my resume, Joe. Sold a property for... So, we co-listed. Arizona guy, Arizona license. They do the showings. I'll go to the national meetings. I flogged this at NCE 10 times, I bet. I have a $12 million property that won't sell for 12. That's how I lead my marketing. It won't go for 12. But my guy's got 12 in it, and he can add lots of money. How much money do you want? 12 million. We can add 12 million, 50 million. We can probably do that without going to the bank. So I took him 15, 20 deals. No, 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 none of that. They did not have any motivation to sell that property, even though it was costing them two fifty dollars a year to hold it. And there was emotion to the house, and there was no emotion to the next deal. And they just wanted to wait until a buyer came along, which they did five, six years later at $7 million or whatever, and it sold. But I was so proud of my listing at $12 million. But I learned everything else without motivation. You're not going to have a closing. Has anybody ever had one of those? Great <laughs> listing. Bill? You learned, didn't you? We learned. A year and a half looking for a ranch. Year and a half. Just a lot of time. Motivation because they had all the money in the world. Yeah. Uh, Ramon, microphone, is it working? Okay, I want you to tell us how you know Bob Steele, and then you're going to guess what I'm wanting you to talk about. Talk to uh, the group. So Bob Steele... Stand up and look at the camera. Bob Steele put together a book called The 300 Ways to Buy, Sell, and Exchange Real Estate. In that book are examples and formulas that we can go through and discuss to help us sell more real estate. Um, probably in September, we're going to kick off book study again. So we've been approaching the strategies that he has in the books in 25 segments. So we'll probably kick off the next 25 uh, study uh, in September sometime. So maybe I'll send it out to Neil and he can get it out to everybody and just join us. We have some resident experts, including the Ted's Time 2 or Ted Squared that have been joining. It's called TNT, Dino Might. TNT, they both been on there and sharing some real world examples. So come join us. Thanks, Ramon. Thank so if you need to understand formulas more, Ramon's book study goes through four or five, one, is it once a week or every other? Every other week. Every other week. And there's 300 formulas that they'll go through. Cash is one way to sell property. There's 300 formulas, 299 ways, other ways to sell and exchange and joint venture and do all kinds of stuff to move through property. 
the problem is the motivation of the client, which leads to a decision to sell or exchange or lease uh, the real estate. Problem is not always negative. Motivation is not always negative. If I sell a property with a big gain, I have a lot of motivation to delay, defer that gain. Uh, my motivation is to move from uh, Colorado to Phoenix. That's my motivation. It's not necessarily negative. It's just understanding uh, what leads to a decision to sell or exchange. Um, G, motivation moves the client towards their desired benefits. The fundamental reason for the existence of the real estate brokerage profession is to assist clients in changing their real estate circumstances in a manner that will maximize the benefits to the client. Doesn't say anything in there about the broker, does it? Uh, Steve Barker, a friend of mine from Charlotte, uh, had this definition of most motivated. At, at our meeting, sometime we'll say, who's most motivated? Oh, I'm an 11 on a scale of one to 10. Just so you know, there is no 11 on a scale of one to 10. But Steve says, whose motivation? Is it the broker, the client, or a third party, which could be a lender? And motivation is determined that if a sale, exchange, or other solution is not perfected within a short period of time, serious consequences will affect the parties associated with the transaction. If a purchase of a 1031 upleg is not perfected within 180 days, serious consequences will affect the parties. If a, if a payoff of the loan is not perfected within three months, serious consequences will affect the parties. If a purchase of a new house in the school district that Linda says we have to be in is not perfected within a short period of time, serious consequences will affect the parties. So when somebody said earlier, well, how are you going to spend the cash? That's always a good question that we never ask our client. If I get you the million dollars, how are you going to spend the cash? Well, I'm going to pay off the 350 loan. That's good to know. I'm going to buy a house in Centennial. That's good to know. If there's any money left over, what are you going to do with that? Oh, I think we'll take a vacation. I think we'll buy a commercial property. I need a new car. It's good to know that kind of information, particularly on a commercial side, a little less on the residential. But your residential sellers will be so shocked that you actually care to ask that they'll say, oh, this broker's a little different than most. They really care about me and what I'm going to do and why I'm needing to do this and the health of my mother-in-law who needs an operation and all that stuff. So, how many of you have a listing today? Keep them up. How many have a listing or a property for sale of your own? Okay, think about that property. You got it? Write down wherever it's got those lines. Is it the next page, Joe? Page five. List the potential motivations to go out of or into title. So if you're a seller, out of. If you're a buyer, into. So if you have cash and you're looking to buy, into. What are the benefits you're seeking? What are the motivations that are driving this? So right now, if you've got a listing or you're selling a property, what are the motivations to go out of title? List them, please. Or if you don't have a property you're working on, just think of some motivations. Okay, shout them out. What are motivations of going out of title? Out of title. Out of a partnership. And that could be 
10 people that invested together, or it could be a husband and wife. Exactly. Uh, get rid of debt that's not working for you. Get rid of debt. I think all debt needs to get rid of. But some of it at 3%, where the property's producing 10%, you need to keep. Motivation. I love, I love better. Better property? Better place to go. Divorce. Partnership, dissolution. Get out of management. Out of management. Half the estate dies. Uh, death. Get more money down for the next transaction. Need money for the next transaction. Don't need her. Get out of money you need to buy some. So the one you just mentioned, Marie, is build a larger estate, basically. Loans coming due. Age. Partner change. Vacancy. Motivations to go into title, solidify a profit, upside, I'm a rehabber. Uh, cash flow, I like the cash flow on that property, whether it's free and clear or encumbered. I'm moving, or my business just needs the other side of town. Um, I want to live higher on the hog, status, income change. Or I need to move to the mobile home park, status or income change, right? I always ask Linda, would you still live with me in a mobile home park? So far, it's been yes. But well, we, well, we haven't had to. If you own the park, Joe says. Thank you. Any questions on motivations? And a lot of times, you can just flip those around. Uh, the reason to go into title could be age, not old age. Could be kids are growing up. Kids need more room. Got a dog. Oh my gosh, looky here. This is the end of session one. We made it before 11.30. So let's do this. Let's go to your second handout. When you got your package, it had a red sheet on the top. There was handout one, and right under it is handout two. So it has three columns. It was right at the front of your handout, and it looks like this. It was not in the exhibits. It was on top of your package we've been going through. Has anybody not found that? It's called Better Counseling Strategies. Better Counseling Strategies. So, let's just pretend we're all beginners. First, there's a typo. I was looking at this first line and I go, well, what's wrong with seeking listings? Hmm, what did I mean there? You meant listings? I, I meant listings and it says listening. Seeks listening. I go, well, that's a good thing. So change listening to listing. And you're thinking, well, there's nothing wrong with getting listings. And I agree to some degree. So beginners mainly seek listings. What would an intermediate person seek? Clients. clients. Seek clients who have the inventory, but we're listing our clients as our inventory. So seek clients. Sells yourself and your company. What would an intermediate or advanced person? What? Benefits. Benefit. Uh, benefits of what? Dealing with me because I'm so sharp? <laughs> Would that be selling a relationship? I'm just, I, I just said, uh, and there's lots of answers. S seek to understand your client, not tell them, you should list with me because I sold 20 properties last year. I got the Goldfinger Award at my local uh, marketing group. I'm the best. That's why you, Shane, should, Sean, should list with me. 
Depends on which finger, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to talk about that later, too. I'm going to use you as an example. You remember getting your physical? Uh, deals in wants, what would an intermediate person do? Needs. Deals in needs. Motivations, another good answer. Ask only property questions. Intermediate, people questions, client questions. Focuses on the cash closing. Insert the word cash closing. Focuses on the cash closing intermediate might. Focus on trade. Louder. Focus on trading. Uh, focus on trading, but not so much trading, just finding the benefits that they seek, which may include a, an exchange. And I'm never saying cash closings are bad. Cash closings are good. But when we can't have one of those, do we quit? Or do we find another way to do it? Cash closings are wonderful. Unless you got the 1031 guy that says, I can't take the cash now. But I'm never going to, I always want a cash closing because I'll 1031 and go buy what I want. So cash closings are fine, but sometimes they just aren't there. Uh, knows about cash buyers. Um, I said list the cash. Not only know about cash buyers, but go list the cash. List the cash. So if I know that Sean has a half a million uh, to buy a warehouse to put some cars in, I'm going to say, Sean, I want to be your exclusive agent. Give me 60 days. I'll find what you want. Can I have 60 days? He'll say yes or no. But try to list the cash so that you're the person out finding what your client needs. Uh, wants buyers versus intermediate. Wants takers. Focuses on cash only buyers. What, what, what would you say there? Owner carry. Benefits, exchange. Gives free advice. I haven't done give free advice since yesterday. I just can't help myself. Particularly if it's about 1031. I just love to talk about 1031. It's giving away advice all the time. But what would an intermediate or an advanced person maybe do instead of giving away free advice? Consultant, webinar, charge by the hour. Doesn't mean you can't build rapport when you're, while you're getting paid. Oh, yeah, here's a good example. Has anybody called their attorney in the last week? Anybody in here? Cleve, was it free? No. Was he a professional? Did you mind paying him? Not at all. Will we do that? Ooh, it's harder. Um, talk a, a beginner talks about property benefits. An intermediate might be property benefits and people benefits. Come on, group. Personal benefits. Client people. I'm going to let you go eat if you just answer a few more questions. Improve my life. There's nothing wrong with improving you and your family's life. But I think as we start out, it's mainly, why'd you get into real estate? I want to make a lot of money. I think I can make a lot of money. As you're in it for a while, hopefully that shifts to what? Help my other business. Louder? Helping others. Help I have made a lot of money. I've made a lot of money. Now I can quit this damn job. Helping others, helping your clients. Thanks the seller and the buyer for the closing. Basically send a gift. I'm going to send you a gift if we close. 
What would an intermediate person do? Ask for referrals. What are you going to do with the cash and can I help you move forward with that and do you know anybody else that I can help and have your CPA and your attorney call me if they need know it. Somebody needs a good broker. Not that I don't send gifts, but very seldom. Is a people pleaser intermediate? Louder? <laughs> Analyzer instead of a pleaser. I didn't hear that. A people analyzer. Okay, thank you. A people analyzer instead of a people pleaser. Uh, I've never heard it put that way, but I think I know what that means. That's good. So what I did was just a mutual liking, mutual respect, not just saying what I think they want to hear. I'm working with a broker right, right now with a, with a client and her cup is so half full of good stuff all the time, no matter what. She goes, oh, that's awesome. I go, that wasn't awesome. I go, oh, that's wonderful. I, I go, just tell me the truth. Just what, how are we doing here? How are we doing? Thinks they are a consultant So consultants give information, sell information. Counselors get. We are not consultants, we are counselors. We are trying to get out of your head everything regarding that property into our head. We are not consulting with you about what you should do. We're trying to find out what you can do successfully in the next deal. Any questions on this? Okay, um, we are going to take a 45 minute break. And, yeah. yeah. You had coined a phrase years ago, MSD, motiv Motivation Seeking Device. MSD, yeah. Motivation Seeking Device. Right, and just expouse on that a little bit, because if you wake up every morning as a broker or a principal, whatever, seeking motivation, you will be far more successful. Okay, thank you. And we have that about 13 slides down. We still have the Motivation Seeking Device slide. Um, but Steele said, if you don't have time, money, and motivation, Find people that are motivated to do something. Go up, down, sideways, buy, sell, lease. The higher their motivation, the higher the chance you're going to have of being successful. So seek motivation. Uh, anything else before we break? Yes. We, will, we will start out, out very timely at um, 12... 15.